The liturgical year of Don Prosper Garanger, Easter Monday. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. So ample and so profound is the mystery of the glorious past that an entire week may well be spent in its meditation. Yesterday, we limited ourselves to the Redeemer's rising from the tomb and showing himself in six different apparitions to them that were dear to him. We will continue to give him the adoration, gratitude, and love which are so justly due to him for the triumph which is both his and ours. But it also behooves us respectfully to study the lessons conveyed by the resurrection of our divine master, that thus the light of the great mystery may the more plentifully shine upon us and our joy be greater. And first of all, what is the Pasch? The scriptures tell us that it is the emulation of the Lamb. To understand the Pasch, we must first understand the mystery of the Lamb. From the earliest ages of the Christian church, we find the Lamb represented in the mosaics and frescoes of the basilicas as the symbol of Christ's sacrifice and triumph. Its attitude of sweet meekness expressed the love wherewith our Jesus shed his blood for us, but it was put standing on a green hill with the four rivers of paradise flowing from beneath its feet, signifying the four gospels, which have made known the glory of his name throughout the earth. At a later period, the lamb was represented holding a cross to which was attached a banner, and this is the form in which we now have the symbol of the Lamb of God. Ever since sin entered the world, man has need of the Lamb. Without the Lamb, he never could have inherited heaven, but would have been, for all eternity, an object of God's just anger. In the very beginning of the world, the just Abel drew down upon himself the mercy of God by offering on a sod-made altar the fairest lamb of his flock. He himself was sacrificed as a lamb, by the murderous hand of his brother, and thus became a type of our divine Lamb, Jesus, who, who was slain by his own Israelite brethren. When Abraham ascended the mountain to make the sacrifice commanded him by God, he emulated on the altar prepared for Isaac the ram he found amidst the thorns. Later on, God spoke to Moses and revealed to him the pasch. It consisted of a lamb that was to be slain and eaten. A few days back, we had read to us the passage from the book of Exodus, where God gives this right to his people. The Paschal lamb was to be without blemish. Its blood was to be sprinkled as a protection against the destroying angel, and its flesh was to be eaten. This was the first Pasch. It was most expressive as a figure, but void of reality. For 1,500 years was it celebrated by God's people and the spiritual-minded among the Jews knew it to be the type of the future lamb. In the age of the great prophets, Isaiah prayed God to fulfill the promise he made at the beginning of the world. We unite in this his sublime and inspired prayer when, during Advent, the church read to us his magnificent prophecies. How fervently did we repeat those words, Send forth, O Lord, the Lamb, the ruler of the earth. This lamb was the long-expected Messiah, and we said to ourselves, Oh, what a Pasch will that be, wherein such a lamb is to be victim! What a feast, wherein he is to be the food of the feasters! When the fullness of time came and God sent his Son upon our earth, the Word made flesh, after thirty years of hidden life, manifested himself to men. He came to the river Jordan, where John was baptizing. No sooner did the Holy Baptist see him than he said to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. By these words, the saintly precursor proclaimed the past, for he was virtually telling men that the earth then possessed the true Lamb, the Lamb of God, of whom it had been in expectation four thousand years. Yes, the Lamb, who was fairer than the one offered by Abel, richer in mystery than the one slain by Abraham on the mount, and more spotless than the one the Israelites were commanded to sacrifice in Egypt had come. He was the lamb so earnestly prayed for by Isaiah 
the lamb sent by God himself. In a word, the lamb of God. A few years would pass, and then the emulation. But three days ago, we assisted at his sacrifice. We witnessed the meek patience wherewith he suffered his executioners to slay him. We have been laved with his precious blood, and it has cleansed us from all our sins. The shedding of this redeeming blood was needed for our past. Unless we had been marked with it, we could not have escaped the sword of the destroying angel. It has made us partake of the purity of the God who so generously shed it for us. Our neophytes have risen whiter than snow from the font wherein that blood was mingled. Poor sinners that had lost the innocence received in their baptism have regained their treasure because the divine energy of that blood has been applied to their souls. The whole assembly of the faithful are clad in the nuptial garment, rich and fair beyond measure, for it has been made white in the blood of the Lamb. But why this festive garment? It is because we are invited to a great banquet, and here again we find our Lamb. He himself is the food of the happy guests, and the banquet is the pasch. The great apostle St. Andrew, when confessing the name of Christ before the pagan council Agius, spoke these sublime words, I daily offer upon the altar the spotless lamb, of whose flesh the whole multitude of the faithful eat. The lamb that is sacrificed remains whole and living. Yesterday, this banquet was celebrated throughout the entire universe. It is kept up during all these days, and by it, we contract a close union with the Lamb, who incorporates himself with us by the divine food he gives us. Nor does the mystery of the Lamb end here. Isaiah besought God to send the Lamb, who was to be the ruler of the earth. He comes, therefore, not only that he may be sacrificed, not only that he may feed us with the sacred flesh, but likewise that he may command the earth and be king. Here again is our Pasch. The Pasch is the announcement of the reign of the Lamb. The citizens of heaven thus proclaim it. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath conquered. But if he be the lion, how is he the Lamb? Let us be attentive to the mystery. Out of love for man, who needed redemption, and a heavenly food that would invigorate, Jesus deigned to be as a Lamb. But he had, moreover, to triumph over his own and our enemies. He had the reign, for all power was given to him in heaven and in earth. In this, his triumph and power, he is a lion. Nothing can resist him. His victory is celebrated this day throughout the world. Listen to the great deacon of Edessa, St. Ephraim. At the twelfth hour, he was taken down from the cross as a lion that slept. Yea, verily, our lion slept, for his rest in the sepulchre was more like sleep than death, as St. Leo remarks. Was not this the fulfillment of Jacob's dying prophecy? This patriarch, speaking of the Messiah that was to be born of his race, said, Judah is a lion's whelp. To the prey, my son, thou art gone up. Resting thou hast crouched as a lion. Who shall rouse him? He was roused himself by his own power. He has risen a lamb for us, a lion for his enemies, thus uniting in his person gentleness and power. This completes the mystery of our Pasch, a lamb, triumphant, obeyed, adored. Let us pay him the homage so justly due, until we be permitted to join in heaven with the millions of angels and the four and twenty elders. Let us repeat here on earth the hymn they are forever singing, the lamb that was slain, is worthy to receive power and divinity and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and benediction. Formerly, the whole of this week was kept as a feast with the obligation of resting from servile work. The edict published by Theodosius in 389 forbidding all law proceedings during the same period was supplementary to this liturgical law, which we find mentioned in the sermons of St. Augustine and in the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. The second of these two holy fathers thus speaks to the newly baptized. You are enjoying a daily introduction during these seven days. We put before you 
a spiritual banquet, that thus we may teach you how to arm yourselves and fight against the devil, who is now preparing to attack you more violently than ever. For the greater is the gift you have received, the greater will be the combat you must go through to preserve it. During these following seven days, you have the word of God preached to you, that you may go forth well prepared to fight with your enemies. Moreover, you know it is usual to keep up a nuptial feast for seven days. You are now celebrating a spiritual marriage, and therefore we have established the custom of a seven-day solemnity. So fervently did the faithful of those times appreciate and love the liturgy, so lively was the interest they took in the newly made children of Holy Mother Church that they joyfully went through the whole of the services of this week. Their hearts were filled with the joy of the resurrection, and they thought it but right to devote their whole time to its celebration. Councils laid down canons, changing the pious custom into a formal law. The Council of Macon in 585 thus words its decree. It behooves us all to fervently celebrate the feast of the past, in which our great high priest was slain for our sins, and to honor it by carefully observing all it prescribes. Let no one therefore do any servile work during these six days, which follow the Sunday. But let all come together to sing the Easter hymns and assist at the daily sacrifice and praise our Creator and Redeemer in the evening, morning, and midday. The councils of Mayence, 813, and Mayu, 845, lay down similar rules. We find the same prescribed in Spain in the 7th century by the edicts of kings Resowind and Wamba. The Greek church renewed them in her council in Trudeau. Charlemagne, Louis the Good, Charles the Bald, sanctioned them in their capitularia, and the canonists of the 11th and 12th centuries, Bouchard, St. Ivo of Chartres, Gratian, tell us they were in force in their time. Finally, Pope Gregory IX inserted them in one of his decretals in the 18th century, but their observance had then fallen into destitute, at least in many places. The council held in Constance in 1094 reduced the solemnity of Easter to the Monday and Tuesday. The two great liturgists, John Balithus in the 12th and Durandus in the 13th century, inform us that, in their times, this was the practice in France. It gradually became the discipline of the whole of the Western Church and continued to be so until relaxation crept still further on and a dispensation was obtained by some countries first for the Tuesday, and finally for the Monday. In order fully to understand the liturgy of the whole Easter octave, low Sunday included, we must remember that the neophytes were formerly present, vested in their white garments at the Mass and divine office of each day. Allusions to their baptism are continually being made in the chants and lessons of the entire week. At Rome, the station for today is the Basilica of St. Peter. On Saturday, the catechumens received the Sacrament of Regeneration in the Lateran Basilica of Our Savior. Yesterday, they celebrated the Resurrection in the magnificent Church of St. Mary. It is just that they should come on this third day to pay their grateful devotions to Peter, on whom Christ has built his whole church. Jesus, our Savior, Mary, Mother of God, and of men, Peter, the visible head of Christ's mystical body. These are the three divine manifestations whereby we first entered and have maintained our place in Christian church. The Mass. The introit, which is taken from the book of Exodus, is addressed to the church's newborn children. It reminds them of the milk and honey which were given to them on the night of Saturday last, after they had received Holy Communion. They are true Israelites, brought into the promised land. Let them therefore praise the Lord, who has chosen them from the pagan world, that he might make them his favored people. The Lord hath brought you into a land flowing with milk and honey. Alleluia. Let then the law of the Lord be ever in your mouth. Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise the Lord and call upon his name. Publish his works among the Gentiles. 
At the sight of Jesus, her spouse, now freed from the bonds of death, Holy Church, praise God that we, the members of this divine head, may come to that perfect liberty of which the resurrection is the type. Our long slavery to sin should have taught us the worth of that liberty of the children of God, which our past has restored to us. The colleague, O God, who by the mystery of the Paschal Solemnity has bestowed remedies on the world, continue, we beseech thee, thy heavenly blessings on thy people, that they may deserve to obtain perfect liberty and advance towards eternal life. Lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. You know the word which hath been published through all Judea. For it began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power, and went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things that he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed, hanging him upon a tree. Him God raised up the third day and gave him to be made manifest, not to all people, but the witnesses preordained by God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he arose again from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was appointed by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. To him all the prophets gave testimony that by his name all receive remission of sins who believe in him. St. Peter spoke these words to Cornelius, the centurion, and to the household and friends of this Gentile, who had called them together to receive the apostle whom God had sent to him. He had come to prepare them for baptism and thus make them the first fruits of the Gentile world. For up to this time, the gospel had been preached only to the Jews. Let us take notice how it is St. Peter and not any other of the apostles who throws open to us Gentiles the door of the church, which Christ has built upon him as upon the impregnable rock. This passage from the Acts of the Apostles is an appropriate lesson for this day, whose station is in the Basilica of St. Peter. It is read near the confession of the great apostle and in presence of the neophytes who have been converted from the worship of false idols to the true faith. Let us observe, too, the method used by the apostle in the conversion of Cornelius and the other Gentiles. He begins by speaking to them concerning Jesus. He tells them of the miracles he wrought. Then, having related how he died the ignominious death of the cross, he insists on the fact of the resurrection as the sure guarantee of his being truly God. He then instructs them on the mission of the apostles whose testimony must be received a testimony which carries persuasion with it, seeing it was most disinterested and availed them nothing save persecution. He, therefore, that believes in the Son of God made flesh, who went about doing good, working all kinds of miracles, who died upon the cross, rose again from the dead, and entrusted to certain men, chosen by himself, the mission of continuing on earth the ministry he had begun. He that confesses all this is worthy to receive by holy baptism, the remission of his sins. Such is the happy lot of Cornelius and his companions. Such has been that of our neophytes. Then is sung the gradual, which repeats the expression of paschal joy. The verse, however, is different from yesterday's and will vary every day till Friday. The Alleluia verse describes the angel coming down from heaven that he may open the empty sepulcher and manifest the self-gained victory of the Redeemer. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. Let Israel now say that the Lord is good, that his mercy endureth forever. Alleluia, alleluia. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and coming. He rolled back the stone and sat upon it. The sequence, Victime Pascali, is from Easter Sunday.
The Gospels according to Luke chapter 24. And behold, two of them went the same day to a town with and behold, two of them went the same day to a town which was sixty furlongs from Jerusalem, named Emmaus. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they talked and reasoned with themselves, Jesus himself, also drawing near, went with them. But their eyes were held, that they should not know him. And he said to them, What are these discourses that you hold one with another as you walk, and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering, said to him, Art thou only a stranger to Jerusalem, and has not known the things that have been done there in these days? To whom he said, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in work and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and princes delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we hoped that it was he that should have redeemed Israel. And now besides all this, Today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women of our company affrighted us, who before it was light were at the sepulchre, and not finding his body, came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. And some of our people went to the sepulchre and found it so as the women had said, but him they found not. And he said to them, O foolish and slow of heart to believe in all things which the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and so to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning him. And they drew nigh to the town whither they were going, and he made as though he would go further. But they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, because It is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in with them. And it came to pass, while he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to the other, Was not our heart burning within us, whilst he spoke in this way, and opened to us the scriptures? And rising up the same hour, They went back to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together, and those that were staying with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how they knew him in the breaking of the bread. Let us attentively consider these three travelers on the road to Emmaus, and go with them in spirit and affection. Two of them are frail men like ourselves, who are afraid of suffering. The cross has disconcerted them. They cannot persevere in the faith unless they find it brings them glory and success. O foolish and slow of hearts, says the third, ought not Christ to have suffered and so to enter into his glory? Hitherto we ourselves have been like these two disciples. Our sentiments have been more those of the Jew than of the Christian. Hence our love of earthly things which has made us heedless of such as are heavenly, and has hereby exposed us to sin. We cannot for the time to come, being thus minded, the glorious resurrection of our Jesus, 
eloquently teaches us how to look upon the crosses sent us by God. However great may be our future trials, we are not likely to be nailed to a cross between two thieves. It is what the Son of God had to undergo. But did the sufferings of the Friday mark the kingly splendor? Mar. But did the sufferings of the Friday mar the kingly splendor of the Sunday's triumph? Nay, is not his present glory redoubled by his past humiliations? Therefore, let us not be cowards when our time for sacrifice comes. Let us think of the eternal reward that is to follow. These two disciples did not know that it was Jesus who was speaking to them. And yet, he no sooner explained to them the plan of God's wisdom and goodness then they understood the mystery of suffering. Their hearts burned within them at hearing him explain how the cross leads to the crown, and had he not held their eyes that they should not know him. They would have discovered from his words that their instructor was Jesus. So will it be with us if we will allow him to speak to us. We shall understand how the disciples is not above the master. Let us this Easter Delight in gazing at the resplendent glory of our risen Lord, and we shall exclaim with the apostle, No, the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. Now that the efforts made by the Christian for his conversion are being recompensed with the honor of approaching the holy banquet clothed in a nuptial garment, there is another consideration that forces itself upon our attention from the reading of today's gospel. It was during the breaking of the bread that the eyes of the two disciples were open to recognize their master. The sacred food which we receive and whose whole virtue comes from the word of Christ gives light to our souls and enables them to see what before was hidden. Yes, this is the effect produced in us by the divine mystery of our past. Provide we be of the number of those who are thus described by the pious author of the following of Christ. They truly know their Lord in the breaking of bread, whose heart burneth so mightily within them from Jesus' walking with them. Let us, therefore, give ourselves unreservedly to our risen Jesus. We belong to him now more than ever, not only because of his having died, but also for his having risen for us. Let us imitate the disciples of Emmaus and, like them, become faithful, joyful, and eager to show forth by our conduct that newness of life of which the Apostle speaks and which alone befits us, seeing that Christ has also loved us as to wish his own resurrection to be ours also. The reason for the choice of this gospel for today is that the station is held in the Basilica of St. Peter. St. Luke here tells us that the two disciples found the apostles already made cognizant of the resurrection of their master. He hath, said they, appeared to Simon. We spoke yesterday of the favor thus shown to the prince of the apostles, which the Roman church so justly commemorates in today's office. The offertory consists of a text from the Holy Gospel referring to the circumstances of our Lord's resurrection. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and said to the women, He whom you seek is risen, as he told you. Alleluia. In the secret, the church prays that the paschal sacrament may be to her children a food nourishing them to immortality and may unite them as members to their divine head, not only for time, but even for eternity. Receive, O Lord, we beseech thee the prayers of thy people together with the offerings of these hosts, that what is consecrated by those paschal mysteries may, by the help of thy grace, avail us to eternal life. During the communion, the church reminds the faithful of the visit paid by the Savior after his resurrection to St. Peter. The faith of his resurrection is the faith of Peter, and the faith of Peter is the foundation of the church and the bond of Catholic unity. The Lord hath risen and appeared to Peter. Alleluia. In the post-communion, the church again prays that her children, who have been fellow guests at the Feast of the Lamb, may have the spirit of concord 
which should reign among the members of one and the same family, whose union has been again cemented by this year's past. Pour forth on us, O Lord, the spirit of thy love, that those whom thou hast filled with the Paschal Sacrament may, by thy goodness, live in perfect concord. The Vespers are the same as yesterday, with the exception of the Magnificon Antiphon and the Colic. The Easter Vespers Deus in adjutoria me mentende, domini ad adjuvendi me festina, doi patre filio spiritui santo, sicut eret in principio, et nuc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen, alleluia, alleluia. The Antiphon, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and going to the stone, rolled it back and sat on it, alleluia, alleluia. Psalm 109. The Lord said to my Lord, his son, sit thou at my right hand and reign with me. Until on the day of thy last coming, I make thy enemies thy footstool. O Christ, the Lord thy father will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Zion. From thence rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. With thee is the principality in the day of thy strength, in the brightness of the saints. For the father has said to thee, from the womb before the day start, I begot thee. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. He has said, speaking of thee, the God-man, thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, O Father, the Lord thy Son is at thy right hand. He hath broken kings in the day of his wrath. He shall also judge among nations in that terrible coming. He shall fill the ruins of the world. He shall crush the heads in the land of many. He shall drink in the way of the torrent of sufferings. Therefore shall he lift up the head on the day of his triumph over death. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and going to the stone, rolled it back and sat on it, Alleluia, Alleluia. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, Alleluia. Psalm 110 I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart, in the counsel of the just and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord sought out according to all his wills. His work is praise and magnificence, and his justice continueth forever and ever. He hath made a remembrance of his wonderful works, being a merciful and gracious Lord. He hath given food to them that fear him. He will be mindful forever of his covenant with men. He will show forth to his people the power of his works, that he may give them his church, the inheritance of the Gentiles. The works of his hand are truth and judgment. All his commandments are faithful, confirmed forever and ever, made in truth and equity. He hath sent redemption to his people. He hath thereby commanded his covenant forever. Holy and terrible is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding to all that do it his praise continueth forever and ever. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, alleluia, and his countenance was as lightning, and his raiment was as snow, alleluia, alleluia. Psalm 111. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. He shall delight exceedingly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the righteous shall be blessed. Glory and wealth shall be in his house, and his justice remaineth forever and ever. To the righteous a light is risen up in darkness. He is merciful and compassionate and just. Acceptable is the man that showeth mercy and lendeth. He shall order his words with judgment, because he shall not be moved forever. The just shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not fear the evil hearing. His heart is ready to hope in the Lord. His heart is strengthened. He shall not be moved until he look over his enemies. He hath distributed. He hath given to the poor. His justice remaineth for ever and ever. His horn shall be exalted in glory. The wicked shall see and shall be angry. He shall gnash with his teeth and pine away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And his countenance was as lightning, and his raiment was as snow. Alleluia, alleluia. The guards were terrified with fear of him and became as men struck dead. Alleluia. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord, ye children. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from henceforth, now and forever. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is as the Lord our God who dwelleth on high and looketh down on the low things in heaven and in earth, rising up the needy from the earth, lifting up the poor out of the dunghill, that he may place him with, princes, with the princes of his people, who maketh a barren woman to dwell in a house, the joyful mother of children. The guards were terrified with fear of him, and became as men struck dead. Alleluia. 
And the angel answering said to the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus. Alleluia. Psalm 113. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a barbarous people, Judea was made his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw and fled. Jordan was turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the hills like the lambs of the flock. What aileth thee, O thou sea, that thou didst flee, and thou, O Jordan, that thou wast turned back? Ye mountains that ye skip like rams, and ye hills like lambs of the flock. At the presence of the Lord the earth was moved, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into pools of water, and the stony hills into fountains of waters. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, lest the Gentiles should say, Where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He hath done all things whatsoever he would. The idols of the Gentiles are silver and gold, the works of the hands of men. They have mouths and speak not. They have eyes and see not. They have ears and hear not. They have noses and smell not. They have hands and feel not. They have feet and walk not. Neither shall they cry out through their throat. Let them that make them become like unto them, and all such as trust in them. The house of Israel hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The house of Aaron hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. They that feared the Lord have hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The Lord hath been mindful of us and hath blessed us. He hath blessed the house of Israel. He hath blessed the house of Aaron. He hath blessed all that fear the Lord, both little and great. May the Lord add blessings upon you, upon you, and upon your children. Blessed be you of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven of heaven is the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead shall not praise thee, O Lord, nor any of them that go down to hell. But we that live bless the Lord from this time now and forever. And the angel answering said to the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, hallelujah. After the Capitulum follows the hymn Ad Regias, which was written by St. Ambrose, though somewhat changed in the 17th century. Having passed the Red Sea and now seated at the royal banquet of the Lamb, clad in our white robes, let us sing a hymn to Christ our King. He, in his divine love for us, gives us the drink of his precious blood, Love is the priest that immolates his sacred body. The destroying angel looks with awe upon the blood that is sprinkled on the thresholds. The sea divides its waters and buries our enemies in its waves. Christ is now our Pasch. He is our Paschal Lamb. He is the unleavened bread of sincerity. Pure food for pure souls. Our truly heavenly victim, by whom hell was vanquished, the fetters of death were broken, and life was awarded to mankind. Christ our conqueror unfolds his banner, for he has subdued the powers of hell. He opens heaven to man and leads captive the prince of darkness. That thou, O Jesus, mayest be an endless paschal joy to our hearts. Free us, who have been regenerated unto life from the dread death of sin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, who rose from the dead, and to the paraclete, for everlasting ages. Amen. Stay with us, O Lord. Alleluia. For it is now evening. Alleluia. The five usual psalms being finished, there is sung the solemn antiphon, which the church repeats in all the canonical hours of this feast. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. What are these discourses that ye hold one with another and are sad? Hallelujah. Let us pray. O God, who by the mystery of the Paschal Solemnity hath bestowed remedies on the world, continue, we beseech thee, thy heavenly blessings on thy people that they may deserve to obtain perfect liberty and advance towards eternal life. It is followed by the canticle of our Blessed Lady, which forms an essential part of the evening office. And while it is being sung, the celebrant Salome senses the altar. The antiphon, and looking, they saw the stone rolled away from the door of the sepulcher, for it was very large. Alleluia. Our Lady's Canticle, St. Luke, Chapter 1. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is from generation unto generation to them that fear him. He hath showed might in his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath received Israel his servant, being mindful of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And looking, they saw the stone rolled away from the door of the sepulcher, for it was very large. Alleluia. Let us pray. 
O God, who on this day, by thy only begotten Son's victory over death, didst open for us a passage to eternity, grant that our prayers, which thy preventing grace inspireth, may by thy help become effectual. Benedica most domino, alleluia, alleluia, Deo gracias, alleluia, alleluia. What are these discourses that ye hold one with another and are sad, alleluia? Let us pray. O God, who by the mystery of the Paschal Solemnity hath bestowed remedies on the world, continue, we beseech thee, thy heavenly blessings on thy people, that they may deserve to obtain perfect liberty and advance towards eternal life. During the benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament, the following joyous canticle is sung in some churches. The Joyful Canticle. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. O ye young men and maidens, on this day the King of Heaven, the King of Glory, rose from the dead, alleluia. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary, Mother James, and Salome, went that they might anoint the body, alleluia. Having been told by Magdalene, two of the disciples ran to the door of the sepulcher, alleluia. But the apostle John outran Peter and was the first at the sepulcher, alleluia. The angel clad in white was sitting there and said to the women that the Lord was risen, alleluia. As the disciples were standing together, Christ stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you all. Alleluia. Didymus, having heard that Jesus had risen, was incredulous. Alleluia. See, Thomas, see my side, see my feet, see my hands. Be not incredulous. Alleluia. As soon as Thomas saw Jesus' side and feet and hands, he said, Thou art my God. Alleluia. Blessed are they that have not seen and have firmly believed. They shall have eternal life. Alleluia. Let us sing hymns of praise and joy on this most holy feast. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Let us give to God our most humble, devout, and do thanks for all these his favors. Alleluia. 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 The Vespers end with the following versicles. Benedica mos domino, Deo gracias, fidelium, anime, permissio, accordium, Dei, re, quiascan, in pace. Amen. Let us glorify the Son of God for his having, on this, the second day of the creation, made the firmament and divided the waters that were under from those that were above it. The Holy Fathers have, in commenting these mysterious words, preferred the spiritual to the material sense. Here we recognize the powerful hand of God who strengthened his work and established an equilibrium between those elements which lay confounded together in chaos. The Mozarabic liturgy gives us the following beautiful prayer wherewith to praise our Creator for this portion of His work. O Christ, O Lord, who, by creating the firmament on the second day, this prefigured the solidity of the Scriptures on which rests Thy Church, and who, by separation of the waters from the waters, didst designate the separation of the heavenly choirs of angels from the weak and inferior creation, man. O thou, the author of the two testaments, who, who didst fulfill the figure of the ancient sacrifice by the new covenant of the emulation of thy body, grant that by understanding and wisdom we may be associated to the angelic powers as to the waters that are above us and may ever tend to heavenly things. May the solidity of the two laws be so fixed in our hearts that the power of thy resurrection may lead us to infinite joy. Let us close the day with two prefaces on the mystery of the resurrection. The first is the one used by the Ambrosian liturgy on Easter Sunday. It is truly meet and just, right and available to salvation, that we should give thanks and devout praise to thee, O holy and almighty God, adorable Father, author and creator of all things, for that Jesus Christ, thy Son, though the Lord of majesty, did deign to suffer the cross for the redemption of mankind. It was this that Abraham, so many ages past, prefigured in his son. It was this that the Mosaic people typified by the emulation of a spotless lamb. This is he of whom sang the holy prophets, who was to bear upon him the sins of all men and wipe away their crimes. This is the past ennobled by the blood of Christ, which makes the faithful exalt with special devotion. O mystery full of grace, O ineffable mystery of God's munificence, O ever to be honored feast of feasts, whereon Christ gave himself to men, that they might slay him, and this, that he might ransom slaves. O truly blessed death, which loosed the bonds of death, now let the prince of hell feel that he is crushed. Now let us, who have been snatched from the abyss, rejoice that we have been exalted 
to the kingdom of heaven. The following preface is one used by the ancient church of Gaul in celebrating the mystery of our Paschal Lamb. It is right and just, and we give thanks to thee, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, by whom thou gavest life to mankind, and wouldest have thy servants Moses and Aaron celebrate the Pasch by the sacrifice of the Lamb. This same right thou didst command to be observed and remembered in after times, even to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He is the spotless lamb that was slain by God's first people when they kept their first Pasch in Egypt. He is the ram taken from the thorns on the top of a high mountain destined for sacrifice. He is the fatted calf slain under the tent of our father Abraham, that it might be served up to his guests. We celebrate his passion and resurrection. We look forward with hope to his last coming. And now let us warm our hearts to the Paschal mystery by this admirable sequence of Adam of St. Victor. Hail, thou day of days, happy day of Jesus' victory, day worthy of ceaseless joy, O first of days. It was on this day that the divine light gladdened the blind with its brightness, that Christ robbed hell of its spoils, conquered death, and made peace between heaven and earth. The sentence of the eternal king concluded all under sin, that the weak might be made strong by heavenly grace. And when the whole world was going headlong to the abyss, the power and wisdom of God softened his anger by his mercy. The old enemy, the author of sin, insulted us in our misery, for that there was no hope left us of the pardon of our sins. The world despaired of a remedy, when lo, whilst all things were in quiet silence, God the Father sent his Son to them that had no hope. The greedy thief, the hellish monster, saw the flesh, but not the snare. He grasped at the hook and was caught. We were restored to our formal dignity by Jesus, whose resurrection now gladdens us. He, the restorer of mankind, rose again, free from the dead. He carried his sheep on his shoulders back to heaven. Peace is made between angels and men. The heavenly ranks are filled up. Praise, eternal praise is due to our triumphant Lord. Let the voice of Mother Church blend in harmony with that of heaven. Let the faithful sing now without ceasing their alleluia. A triumph has been won over the power of death. Let us rejoice in the triumph. Peace on earth and jubilee in heaven. Amen.